Science Cafe is a place where we try and connect scientists with the public, regular people like you and me, to talk about things that are important in New Hampshire and learn from our panelists, but learn from each other too. So in the six years we've been doing this, we've covered 65 topics, more than that, from climate change to digital security, vaccinations, West Nile disease, and even the science of beer, wine, and coffee. So tonight we're here to talk about prosthetics and adaptive technologies, which I think is a really interesting topic, uh, especially considering the number of disabled people uh, in our country and the hope that innovation and technology can give them. So the format that we use at Science Cafe is pretty straightforward. I will do a brief introduction of the panelists and then I'll let them introduce themselves a little more deeply. And then we throw it open to question and answer from you people, because our goal is to answer the questions that you have, not to provide lecture. And now I'd like to introduce our panel. I'll, I'll start with the rose between the thorns. <laughs> Are you going to argue with me? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> okay. So Wendy Katsikas, is that right? Katsikas was an assistant, assistant principal of McDonough School in Manchester for 15 years, which is a K-5 school. Before that, she taught elementary music for 23 years, often going from room to room with all of her stuff. I think we all remember that person. <laughs> they don't do that anymore, I guess. <laughs> Over 42 years ago, she was hit by a stolen car that was being pursued by an unmarked police car in Manchester. No lights, no siren, no warning. She was on the sidewalk when the driver lost control and came up on the sidewalk. Her ankle was crushed between the curb and the fender of the car, causing a near-complete traumatic amputation of her left foot. There was literally nothing that could be done to save her foot, so she is a prosthetic user for 42 years. and. Uh, thank you for being here. Pleasure. All right, Michael Neeland is a graduate. What? One thorn. <laughs> one thorn number one. <laughs> Michael Neeland is a graduate of UMass Amherst, Tufts Medical School, and the Harvard School of Public Health. He completed his residency in internal medicine at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Boston. He's taught epidemiology and biostatistics to nursing students and medical students for several years. Several years. Uh, <laughs> we won't say how many. I'll give my age away. Dr. Neeland is also active in the New England Disabled Sports Program at Loon Mountain, so he has a lot of hands-on experience with disabled people. And finally, our second thorn, Matt Albuquerque is an ABC certified prosthetist and orthotist. Is that right? With over 25 years of experience in the field, Matt is the founder and president of Next Step Bionics and Prosthetics in Manchester, and he graduated from Stonehill College with a, with a BS in biology. He underwent his orthotic training at Rancho Los Amigos Medical Center through uh, the University of California and received his prosthetic instruction at Northwestern University. So with that, I will ask each of you to give a couple minutes of introduction and maybe each answer the question of what do you want people to learn here tonight? We'll start with the rose, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really don't know what else I should tell you about myself, except um, nobody ever told me I couldn't do anything, so I just went ahead and did it. 42 years ago, there wasn't a lot of support after you finished with the doctor and you got a prosthesis. You were pretty much supposed to figure it out on your own, so I did. Um, what I hope you get from this conversation is an appreciation um, for what I believe is that uh, I believe I'll always be disabled, obviously, I'm missing part of my leg, but I'm only handicapped by that disability when I can't do something I want to do. And quite frankly, um, the only thing I can't do that I can come up with right away is tiptoe. So it's great. To, I feel a bit out of place with this suit on, but I came, I came right from work in, in Worcester. That's where the medical school is. And I'm, I'm an associate dean there, and I do a lot of teaching for our students. And my training, as you heard, is in internal uh, medicine. But I'm principally here because uh, I'm about to be year six with New England Disabled Sports, 
which is subsidiary of the ski school at Loon Mountain. And we, and I have two of my sister coaches uh, with me tonight, we, uh, we specialize and have and have special training beyond the routine ski instructor training on working with individuals who have challenges. The challenges can be uh, mental challenges or they could be physical challenges. So, for example, we have many students who are who have autism. And of those on autism, some are mildly autistic and some are severely autistic. We have uh, students with developmental delay, uh, amputees, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. We have veterans that come from the VA who had uh, difficult experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we work with them at special times. So it's a, it's a wonderful place to be. And I obviously love being a physician, and I hope along the way in my career I've helped one or two folks. But the joy that all of us coaches have uh, serving individuals who have challenges and getting them to a point of independence, whatever it is we're teaching them, is, is, uh, is very rewarding. Thorn too. Ah, nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Albuquerque, and uh, my official title is I am a certified prosthetist. Yeah, right. I don't know why they gave us a name like that, but that's our official title. So my training, my background is in the fitting and the design of artificial limbs, but it's really taking care of amputees uh, is, is what it comes down to. And uh, obviously in the last few years, prosthetics has been uh, in the mainstream, mainly because of the marathon, uh, the conflicts. Uh, there's really been a focus on the technology or the lack of technology that existed uh, and the need to make that technology better. Uh, what do I hope that you take away from here? You know, people ask me a lot, uh, what I do, uh, and I don't say that we make legs, I say that we sell hope to people. Uh, and that's really what I hope you can take away from here is really see where technology is, uh, having a, a living example talk to you about what that technology is. Can you tell us a little bit about the history and where you're at now with your prosthesis, um, whether it's gotten more mechanized or computerized or how that works, and maybe Matt can fill us in on what's, uh, what to look forward in the future. Sure. 42 years ago, I was an immediate fit, which means I, I immediately had a casting put on my, my stump after my second surgery. And two days after that surgery, I was up walking. It had a removable foot. So when I got up, I put the foot on. I left the cast stayed on at that point. It was a cylinder cast. Um, my first prosthesis was very temporary and had a plaster socket um, and a removable foot. And then I was fitted with one that um, had a solid ankle cushion heel called a satch foot. Um, I wore that for quite a while, quite, or that type of foot for quite a while. Um, Gradually, the technology came about that gave me more flexibility in my ankle, and um, I've been to like three companies in my 42 years, and by far, Next Step has done the most for me. Um, but each each time I got a prosthesis, it was a little twist. The technology had changed a little bit um, to the point where now my prosthetic is made out of carbon fiber, mostly, if not all. I'm double checking with him because I just let them make it. Um, <laughs> I, it. I have a cosmetic cover on mine. I think it's the last one I'm going to have with a cosmetic cover. I don't really need it. I had it because um, originally you just got it. It just I put a some kind of a cover on it so it would look like a leg. Um, and I taught elementary school. It just seemed easier. Plus, I like wearing pantyhose and tights. You can't do that on a, a leg without a cosmetic cover, or at least you know, not if you want to not rip hose an awful lot. Anyway, um, so my, my current prosthesis is carbon fiber. There's a lot of flex in the ankle. Um, there's a lot of side to side flex now, a lot of front to back. It's energy storing. So when I step on it, the energy goes into the heel and I get it back when I walk out. So my gait's very natural. There are people who have known me for years, literally years, and had no clue that I was a, uh, an amputee. People will ask what's wrong with my knee because of my suspension sleeve. There's nothing wrong with my knee. 
it's actually in better shape than my other knee. Um, but that's what they notice. They don't even notice that it's a prosthesis. They don't notice it from my gait. They don't notice it. And that is because of, of the technology that has been developed over the, my God, nearly 50 years, I have to begin saying, uh, since I became an amputee. I was 22 when I became an amputee. So it's been a long road, but it's been a pretty good one. Um, would you like Matt to talk a little bit about technology? Sure. So really, um, what they're working on now is powered prosthetics. Everything that Wendy has if, is passive, meaning that she generates the energy based on what she puts into it, meaning she has to bend it for it to unbend and create that energy that she was talking about. And energy storing is a big, big thing for people who have had amputations because they have to expend two to three times the energy to walk as normally as you and I do. So anytime that we can decrease the amount of energy that they use from a metabolic standpoint over the course of the day, thousands of steps, it really does save a lot. That's why Wendy was talking about the flexibility in her ankle. Uh, at first, she had a glorified piece of foam rubber early, very early on. It's the, the, that's, that's what it was. And now it's a, a laminated, multi-layer carbon fiber foot that has a degree of compliance to it. So it adapts to the ground as she walks on it. Uh, so so the big thing now is power. They actually came out with a bionic ankle foot system. It's, it's called Biome, B-I-O-M, and it's a lithium ion polymer battery that drives a little worm gear in the foot. And after the worm gear compresses, it lets go at a certain time and literally propels you forward. This question right here in front of you. I just want to say that I met Wendy maybe 30 years ago when I started working in the Manchester school system. I am an occupational therapist, and I didn't know, Wendy had to tell me that she was an amputee, because even then with the earlier prosthetic, I didn't pick up a difference in her gait, and that is something as a therapist that I tend to notice. But another thing I was wondering, because you mentioned the $6 million man, are these covered well by insurance and how many do you have to wait a certain number of years to get an upgrade or a new fitting or how does that kind of payment work for you from the consumer point of view I've never had a problem with insurance, and uh, my prosthesis is covered 100%. I have an excellent, excellent insurance plan. I could never complain about it. Um, I don't know what happens next year when I go on Medicare. <laughs> But I'll have a supplemental plan, so I'm, I'm not assuming that anything bad will happen. But Matt probably knows more about that than I do. Yeah, uh, private insurance, there's all kinds of plans. Medicare covers at 80%. And the type of the prosthesis is dependent upon a functional test that Medicare has us give people. Uh, and there's four different levels. Uh, and then the prosthesis is based on which one of those K levels that you fall into. And, uh, you know, on some instance, it may be limiting, but say somebody comes in at a K2, which is on the lower side, Medicare allows us to fit that person, send them to a therapist, have them do better, retake the test so they come up from K2 to a K3, and then they get a better prosthesis after showing that ability. So uh, really, the, the, the whole issue is the challenge is the 20%. For, for a lot of people, these are expensive items. So that's really where the, the creativity has come in the last few years. I had a couple of fingers amputated, uh, like one year old. Um, and I've kept up more than the average person with, with um, things like prosthetics. And I've seen the, uh, the ones that take you the muscle impulses. Yep. for powered prosthetics, but uh, from what I've seen, they don't generally seem to be very, like, precise, and uh, like Wendy, I've come up with my own way to do things, yep. uh, and, but I'm thinking of typing in particular, yep. and I'm wondering about the precision, uh, like, precision movements like typing. Is that something that's on the horizon or far off? 
That's a great segue. <laughs> <laughs> I have an article here I'm going to show you, and it is wrapped up because you don't want to walk down the street with one of these. <laughs> yeah. Communicate. <laughs> Whoa. So this this is going to answer your question to a certain degree. Um, can you hear me okay? Can I have a mic? No, we need it for the TV. Oh, okay. Can you? Do you want me to hold it? No, I want Wendy to do it. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, know each other kind of thing. Uh, this is uh, pretty revolutionary. This is uh, not the most revolutionary hand on the market. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, it's the one I could get my hands on. No pun intended. I'm sorry. That was awful. That was horrible. A little humor here and there. You're going to hear some of it. Uh, this is called an eye limb. An eye limb revolutionized upper limb prosthetics because uh, in the early 70s, electronic hands came out and they had one grip, which is basically uh, a vice grip. It's a three-jaw chuck. But it did that. It looked like it hand, had four fingers. But you're right. As far as precision goes, it really wasn't precise. That's why a lot of people that were wearing split hooks at the time actually did m more fine motor stuff with that split hook than they were with something that looked like a hand. And if I had to say to any one of you, when you wake up in the morning, I want you to use this grip and this grip only, I guarantee by 9 o'clock you'd be out of your mind because we use so many different grips in our hands to be functional, six or seven for the most part. So even though it was an electronic hand, it really didn't meet the mark until a hand like this came out. This is a, a company by the name of Touch Bionics. They were just acquired by another manufacturer because the same thing's happening in our profession. And this was the first hand that allowed the hand to change grips based on the activity. So I'll get into how it's controlled. This is obviously a flashlight. This is not a prosthesis, but it really shows the function of the hand. And then I'll talk to you what this would look like if it was a prosthesis that somebody was wearing. So this is battery operated, and it basically works off of those open and close signals. Right now, I have a, a button right here on the flashlight that basically allows me to close it and open it. Close and open. Very, very simple, pretty cool though. Thumbs right on top of the hand. Uh, so you'll notice this technology uh, is revolutionary from the standpoint that I'm going to cycle it, and when I open it and it fully opens, you'll notice that the index finger will flutter. When it flutters, it has an accelerometer in it, and it reads the motion that I do once the finger flickers. And I have four options, forward, back, or side to side. Each time I enter one of those motions, it changes the grip on the hand that I pre-programmed before I got here. But we would find out the grips that you would want to use, and then we would use those grips for whatever motion. So uh, if you can see it, I'm going to try to show it to you. Watch the index finger. It will flicker. I changed it. Now we're in typing grip. That's awesome. So you'll notice I'll close, I'll open, the finger will flicker again, I'll move it back, and it will change into another grip. It will open first, it will wait for the other fingers to join along, it will flicker, I'll move it back, and now we're into, I'm sorry, the same grip, I didn't go to a different motion, let me do that again. Open, the fingers will open now, then it will flicker, I'll go to this side, and now I'm in what we would call a credit card or a lateral grip. Put your credit card in there for the ATM machine, um, thing like that. Now, this has access to a whole boatload of grips. My job is when I meet you is to figure out what you want to do, find the grips that you need access to, and then set up those motions so when you move that hand, it will, uh, it will do those things for you. I know that I'll, we have a lot more 
um, people with disabilities now because of technology in the medical field to be able to, I mean, just the other day with that problem uh, down in Las Vegas, a lot of people survived just because of the uh, medical response that's available now. Uh, can you speak to how the psychology of that uh, occurs and how people, uh, have they made advances in the psychology uh, working with people like Wendy and uh, because there must be a psychological element to all of this um, as well? Well, I'll ask, uh, have, ask Wendy to comment on, on she might have a little more knowledge on that on this, but I, I speak a little bit about the very, very sad ev events in Las Vegas, and all of us, I know, our hearts are with those uh, families that lost loved ones, and then the very brave people who did their best to, uh, to save and to rescue. Uh, I'll just say, I want to say just a couple of things in general. It may not exactly answer your question. I heard uh, driving up, I have CNN on the satellite radio, driving up from Worcester, that none of the victims brought to the hospitals in Vegas had an amputation. I, find, I don't know what they had, but I, I can imagine that there were many severe wounds to the legs. And to me, that speaks to their skill and their training as trauma surgeons, which takes a lot of time to, to go through that, um, but also the medical advances on what they can do to save limbs that previously they might not have been able to save. So that is a, a rich part of research that folks like that do, and that figure uh, I found to be uh, quite, uh, quite amazing. I think in the psychology, clearly those individuals, everyone involved in that situation, it would seem to me, would need some sort of help. Um, and I'm not just talking about those who, who were injured, they perhaps need the most help, but I can only imagine, and I'm sure you too, how would we react if we were there and saw dead people lying on the ground, bleeding from severe wounds, bullets raining around us, how would, I, I can't imagine that. So I think all of those folks need to be offered uh, psychological help. And I'll ask, and Wendy can talk about the trauma. Now on a little bit, if I could just switch gears temporarily, uh, I looked at a website that the clinicians use uh, in the hospitals uh, quite a bit. It's, it's geared for medical professionals, doctors, nurses, and it said that the most common amputations are actually the fingers, the digits. Uh, the second most common uh, are the legs, and a high proportion of the leg amputations is related to diabetes. So what happens is uncontrolled, poorly controlled diabetes affects the flow of blood to the legs. That means that oxygen is not getting to the legs. It also affects the nerves so that they can't feel if they have a, a, a puncture injury. And in severe cases, the lack of blood flow, uh, a, an infection which is very hard to treat on occasion because of the lack of blood flow uh, can in worse situation, the worst can lead to amputation. So the public health message here is, if any of us here has diabetes, uh, keeping it under control is very, very important to keep our arteries working properly and they don't get all clogged up. So maybe you could comment on the psychology part. Well, way back in the dark ages when I became an amputee, there w it really wasn't a lot. Um, I got no counseling whatsoever. But I was young and stupid and didn't know that I couldn't do. I couldn't. I was actually a student teacher at the time. I went back to student teaching three weeks after I had my foot amputated. I was young and stupid. But I graduated. I finished school and I started teaching the next fall. Um, I got married two and a half months after my amputation. Um, so I had a lot going for me. I had a supportive family. I was a newlywed. The life, life was really good, except I didn't walk the way I used to. Life was really good. Um, as I've gotten older, um, it, I think it's harder when you're older. And as I've gotten older and life has thrown more things at me, I have had what's um, been referred to as an eventful life. Um, 
it's harder to recover from them, I think, as you're older. So I think an older amputee, probably, I think any amputee nowadays is recognized, you probably should have some counseling of, of some sort. But I think it's even more important for someone older who maybe isn't as young and stupid and um, maybe has more physical, other physical things going on with them where it, it, it gives you, it would give you more cause to worry. Uh, well, how am I going to do this? Thank you. This is my son, Doug, by the way, here. But uh, that leads to my question, which you were, t we were talking about the psychology earlier, and Matt, you were saying rightly that there aren't a whole lot of people around with missing digits and, and missing limbs. But uh, that leads me to wonder, are there any support groups in this area for, for those kinds of people to get together and share things? Uh, there is, but I wouldn't say the support group focuses in on what he would want to know. Do, do, do you know what I mean? A lot of the times the support group is is what I was saying to you about uh, calling Wendy. You know, if we had somebody her age, and not that she's old because she's not, that was about to lose her leg, we would ask Wendy to go in. That's the support group at that point in time. Not necessarily go into a room full of people that have had amputations, and I'm not disregarding the benefit of that, but to really be able to talk to somebody his age, same position, look, this is what I want to do. How do you go about doing the same things? That's true support at that point in time. That's real time, real world, applicable to, to what he's going through now and not what somebody else may be going through that isn't anywhere near the position that he's in. You're welcome. Proud dad. <laughs> You, you mentioned actually um, uh, if you uh, wanting to dance with your your spouse. Somebody mentioned that anyway. If I and I don't have a prosthetic, but if I lost a leg, that'd be the first thing I'd want to get back. And then I would think, well, then I'm a lousy dancer, so I'd like a leg that would dance better, that could spin, <laughs> which leads to the question of, and that the runner in South Africa brought it up: is it are prosthetics getting to the point where they can be better than? Uh, what they are replacing is this some weird you know scientific dream science fiction dream or is this a real thing to the point where you know 10 years from now people are going to be wanting a prosthetic so they can you know jump higher and you bring up a, a, a discussion that's happening in the ethical world and it's really replacement versus augmentation and even in the DARPA project that we were working on revolutionizing prosthetics they were very very specific that this was about replacement and not necessarily augmentation I truly believe that it is going to be augmented there'll be Olympics that normal people won't be able to go into, and it will be people with powered prosthetics. No doubt about it. Um, even with passive prosthetics right now, those guys are getting within a second or a second and a half of the world record for normies. That's what amputees call all of us normies. Um, and you think of a, half, a, a second and a half being a world of time in track and field, I agree it is. Not for a guy that's missing his leg, though. And, and when you think of how close that's getting, we're getting real close where they're going to start getting beat. And what, what is changing that paradigm, just so you know, what's changing now for the first time in my career is that we have people coming in with fused ankles, fused knees, things that had been done from a reconstructive standpoint over the years when prosthetic technology wasn't that high. We have those people coming in now considering elective amputation which has brought up a whole nother ethical issue with surgeons in regards to do you amputate a leg, really that is still functional and intact to a certain degree. That brings up the quality of life issue, which is a whole nother, whole nother subject. All right, probably the most simple question of the night, but I, I don't know, so I figured I would ask, um, do you take a prosthetic off at night or do you sleep with it? It comes off at night. That's probably one of the most frustrating things is if you have to get up in the middle of the night and you're a lower limb amputee, you have to put your leg back on. I used to hop. 
<laughs> then I got older and I have absolutely no, I don't trust my knee. I don't hop anymore. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm in healthcare and I believe in it very much, so I'm, I'm all set. But I also wanted to ask you a question, and you're at UMass yes. and training physicians, and I'm just curious, I'm guessing orthopedic surgeons and vascular surgeons particularly, uh, what's going on in terms of training them about these things and, and getting them acclimated to dealing with these kinds of issues past just doing the surgery? Well, they actually get a fair amount of training in these areas for, for reasons which we've heard from our expert. That's become, that's a part of the profession that they'll be practicing once they finish their training and are on their own. So they do, uh, they do get training uh, in those areas. It's very important uh, to them. Um, Orthopedic surgery is not the only specialty that would get that kind of training. Um, neurology, you know, the, uh, for example, to be a neurologist, there might be issues that they were involved with that, that might intersect with this. Uh, trauma surgeons, of course. So it, it covers uh, a fair amount of specialties. For those who are in internal medicine, family medicine, psychiatry, uh, probably not so much. So I'm curious, you know, right. <laughs> especially when you're thinking about children, these prostheses must change over time. And so I'm curious about how long are they good for, how fast do you outgrow them, and then secondarily, how many different kinds are there? So depending on my activity, you know, I assume there's different kinds of appendages for different activities. So, especially in terms of kids, you know, how does that work for them? Yeah, so for kids, uh, it's almost uh, yearly because they grow so much. And when you think about if they need a new shoe size, <laughs> They almost need a new prosthesis. It's almost the same kind of growth. Uh, there's certain things that we can adjust for growth, but once at some point in time we run out of options and then a kid is indicated to get a new prosthesis. With adults, we may see them every three to five years. With kids, it's probably a year to 18 months, especially if they're in the middle of a growth spurt. Uh, we see them fairly regularly. So. Um, yeah, kids end up being in our office probably much more than they want to, so. Matt says he sees us every three to five years. Um, he sees us a lot more often than that. Um, fabrication for, of a new prosthesis tends to be about three to five years. The longest one I ever used was six years. Um, but mine is now two years old, and I'm lo gained weight, lost weight, gained weight. Things change like that, so you always have to keep adjusting socks or adjusting this or adjusting that and I in fact have an appointment next week. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I need a new suspension sleeve. No, I just need it put on. I have it. <laughs> I just need it put on and some other things. Well, it's a, a thank you to all of you rather than a question or comment. First of all, I'm a speech language pathologist, so I know about fighting with insurance companies to fund my kids' communication systems. But my dad, who passed in 1989, was uh, an above the knee double amputee. And to see the advances in technology, I wish because he was an amazing uh, prosthetic user, considering that he was in his 60s. Um, and everybody was amazed that he could walk upstairs and everything, yet they were enormously heavy and unwieldy, and uh, as good as he was, I keep thinking about if he had lived just another 10 or 15 years, what the technology could have done for him in terms of, in terms of he really mostly missed driving a standard shift car. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. The question is, you mentioned children and adults need their prosthesis changed every so often. What happens to the old ones? Can they be reused? Great question. So everything that we build now is modular. And what changes uh, is the part that they put their limb into. This hand may last for 10 years. What changes is, like in Wendy's prosthesis, her limb changes. 
the limb that goes into that prosthesis, it gets smaller, the muscles atrophy a little bit. So a lot of the times we'll take off the socket, the top part of it, remake that and put it back onto the rest of the prosthesis. So we're reusing her foot, the prosthetic pylon, uh, and not necessarily remaking the whole thing. Um, uh, a big change back was we used to, it used to be made out of balsa wood believe it or not and it was one one piece of balsa wood i'm sure wendy had one of those that was the big heavy oh god uh brutal now we have carbon fiber uh and if you were to even pick up wendy's leg it's less than the leg that she had amputated and that's really changed a lot for people with amputations because carbon fiber gave us a material that's incredibly strong and light. It doesn't need to be really thick for it to be supportive. In fact, if you looked at the walls of Wendy's prosthesis, they're probably less than an eighth of an inch thick. So I'll ask Dr. Neeland, since he's been kind of quiet lately, to fill us in on Ned. Tell us, tell us more about Ned. Well, <clears throat> First of all, we've been talking about New England Disabled Sports NEDs in terms of winter sports for individuals with challenges with adaptive needs. It's actually a program that goes year round. So in the summer, they have swimming activities, they have golfing activities, so it's, it's a full year. Uh, I'm only involved in the winter because I can't hit a golf ball. Um, <laughs> so we have about 200 coaches, instructors, uh, pretty carefully selected, I may say. Uh, we are, compared to those in the ski school who don't do individuals with adaptive needs, we're older. Um, I would think a little more mature. <laughs> not so sure, <laughs> speaking for myself. Um, but um, every one of us, and we're all volunteers, we don't get paid a nickel to do this. Uh, many of us have gone through certification processes with the Professional Ski Instructor of America to, uh, to do what we do, to get expertise. Um, and uh, we have a certain number of days which we're required to, to do at NEDS. Uh, most of us do more than the minimum requirement. Especially when the call goes out that there's a lot of in the students coming in, skiers, athletes, and we don't have enough coaches, we all get on our cell phones, and we always rise uh, to the occasion. We've mentioned the military folks a few times, and I spent many years in the military, going back to the 60s. Um, we, we have a special relationship with them, and the ones that I've been with are PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. They're remarkable individuals. And um, it's, it's a special privilege for us, really, to, to, to put some joy in their lives. The last veteran I was with was about 26 year old, and he was so much better a skier than me. I am. I had to tell him, slow down, will you? It's going to look really bad if I lose you. <laughs> and I have to call in to say, I lost my student. So, um, so it's a wonderful organization. Matt, you want to make a closing statement? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I would wrap all of that up in terms of a philosophy that we have at Next Step, and it's an acronym for CARE, because everything that we're talking about comes down to CARE. It's an acronym for four words, compassion, attention, respect, and empathy. And if you look at CARE within the confines of those four words, you really do end up caring. And uh, that's everything that we're talking about here in terms of having somebody that's vulnerable and caring enough about them to want to change things for them. So thanks a lot for your attention tonight. It was really nice talking to all of you. Please thank our panel. Thanks. We'll see you next month. Appreciate you coming.